Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Army Warrior Corner. This morning's topic is installations of the future enabling war fighting readiness. I'm Richard Kidd, and I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Strategic Integration in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installations, Energy, and the Environment. This morning, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you two leaders in the installation community, Mr. Randy Robinson, the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installations, Energy, and the Environment, and Lieutenant General Gwynne Bingham, the Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management. At this time, before we get started, I would like to show you, a, I'd like to direct your attention to the monitor in a video developed by our partners in the Training and Doctorate Command. This video depicts the operational environment of our installations today, for the future is now. got to maintain our ability to maneuver. We maneuver information and we maneuver leadership to get to a position of advantage. Installations are the initial maneuver platform of the Army. From outposts to forts to current day installations, the home base of the Army has evolved over time and must continue to evolve in advance of an enemy who will leverage current and future means of attacks to hinder Army missions. Technology creates opportunities for the Army, but also opens up a new realm of vulnerabilities that must be guarded against. Installations are where soldiers live, raise families, train, generate combat power, and conduct warfighting missions. They are part of the modern battle space and thus are subject to attack by an enemy that will leverage conventional, unconventional, or new technology to its advantage. Emerging threats have changed the Army's operational environment. In response, the battle space has expanded we need to reconsider how we view Army installations. They are part of the strategic support area that stretches from the homeland to initial point of entry. In detail, a strategic support area encompasses home ports and stations, strategic sea and air lines of communication, and homeland communications. Traversing through and operating within the strategic support area will undoubtedly require acute cross-combatant command coordination. In the past, terrain, politics, and the enemy were known. Today, multiple adversaries with increasingly sophisticated capabilities are actively using hybrid and asymmetric strategies to pursue their objectives under the threshold of armed conflict. Emerging and non-traditional threats mean installations are now part of the fight. Soldiers live, train, deploy, direct operations, and even fight from their installations. They are exposed and vulnerable to adversaries and disruptions. We must plan for their continued holistic support to our defense. Doctrine must evolve before the Army faces potential enemies, not after. The prevailing challenges facing the U.S. military today demonstrate a battlefield that is being compressed. Yet the framework for multi-domain battle is geographically massive. Inability to assure communications and domain superiority is an entirely new challenge that must be addressed. Our adversaries will seek to strip away the Army's ability to maneuver using cyber, information, and unconventional warfare to deadlock our soldiers and leaders and decouple Army warfighting functions one by one. On July 27, 2017, Popular Mechanics published an article about a Russian drone flying over Ukraine carrying a single thermite grenade which destroyed the largest ammunition depot in the world, killing one, injuring five others, and causing over a billion dollars of damage. Exploiting growing vulnerabilities of soft targets on military bases, unconventional saboteurs are using readily available consumer drones not to inflict mass casualties, but to create havoc and take away their adversaries' ability to maneuver. Commercial drones are readily available, and reports of incursions into no-fly zones and around military installations are increasing and are cause for alarm and active defense plans. The adversary can use the most routine of devices to impede the Army's mission. We must take a lesson from Ukraine and prepare for this type of attack. A unit is making preparations to deploy. By monitoring social media feeds, an adversary can monitor base operations and activities by what soldiers and families share on the web. Through observation and the information gleaned from online sources, a picture is painted providing the adversary the ability to hinder deployments by destroying a section of the travel route. Past incidents have instilled in the public psyche the possibility of risk to the homeland. Adversaries could create a false narrative, perhaps one even rooted in actual events, of a chemical spill or biological agent release that could cause widespread panic, forcing widespread evacuations. 
Such a scenario could turn a simple true event, such as road closures for an actual convoy moving chemical materials, into a public relations crisis. The adversary could launch a flurry of social media posts of people suffering from false symptoms or worse. These postings could start to migrate to TV and radio and affect public perception, create panic, and place a strain on the resources of first responders, local authorities, medical staff, facilities, and the installation. What happens when the Army's ability to conduct warfare is attacked, picked off or disrupted by multiple attacks? We must guard against social media posts that prey upon families and soldiers, hacked computer systems that impede information, power disruptions that affect infrastructure, contaminated water reservoirs that affect performance and morale. What if the enemy creates or capitalizes upon natural disasters that draw upon resources and limit maneuverability, create chaos and cloud focus? What happens when a brigade isn't physically able to deploy? We must update our concepts in the way we think about installations. They are no longer safe havens, but rather the first skirmish lines of future defense. In the end, defeating the U.S. Army with its own installations may seem far-fetched, but the fact adversaries seek to deny Army maneuver with them is certainly not. The Army is taking steps to ensure that these vulnerabilities are met head-on and that installations can withstand attacks from multiple domains. Through continual assessment of new technology, the Army will remain informed and prepared to meet challenges from our adversaries. By applying new technology, the Army will create resilient and sustainable communities for our soldiers to live, train, and fight remotely. The Army is planning for the installations of the future that can meet the emerging threats today and ensure our Army always has strong initial maneuver platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Randy Robinson and Lieutenant General Gwen Bingham. Good, good morning. Mic on. Are we on? No. Test. You got me now? Okay, you got me now. Well, good, uh, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you all here. We have a few seats up front, a lot of people in the back. I would encourage you all to move in. So the folks in, the, uh, in the, uh, the aisle there behind you all can get through. Or you can stand. Greg Kerr, come on up here, buddy. There you go. I'll single you out. Well, I tell you, it, it's very critical. I hope this, uh, this video just gave you some insights on the importance of looking and planning for installations of the future because the outcome is paramount to the warfighting readiness of our Army. Installations are a critical and crucial part of Army readiness. They exist to produce, deploy, and project combat power. So the Army, we've been looking at this, we realize that we must undertake a deliberative process to consider what installations should do and how to, to smartly invest in changes today. And that's to invest in things for needs and requirements of the future. We should not be look, uh, asking the question and looking at what we want our installations to look at, but more importantly, we need to be asking what do we want our installations to do. Let's look at the reality of today that tells us where we are as we plan for the future, because that must come into consideration. In accordance with Army priorities, the Army has taken risk in installations to fund training and unit readiness. Thus, resourcing for our installations and base ops has, has not been at the forefront of the Army's focused investment. We realize there's a need, but we allocate our scarce resources to ensure that the soldiers' units are trained and ready uh, to fight our nation's wars. If we look at the processes and we look today, what is important to us? What are we looking at? Uh, working diligently uh, with our partners, my partners, Lieutenant General Gwen Bingham, a daily ba battle buddy, uh, Lieutenant General Katie Dahl, another battle buddy. We coordinate, uh, if, if not with uh, General Bingham weekly, General Dahl, uh, excuse me, General Bingham daily, General Dahl uh, weekly on what's important. And we're re-emphasizing and changing the way that we're looking at the prioritization process with the Army. 
We've got to look at priorities, and we've got to make sure that they're all focused on Army priorities and we're resourcing to those Army priorities. What's important? We're looking at facility readiness drivers. That's something General Bingham and her staff, uh, the Installation Support Directorate, and Kim O'Keefe and Resource Management have done a diligent job, uh, an outstanding job, looking to identify the condition of our facilities and I'm sure you all have heard that 22% of our facilities are in poor or failing condition. To buy those back to get to an adequate standard would be about $10.8 billion. But we're looking at those facilities to determine which ones have the most impact and the most importance to war fighting readiness. If you look at those facilities, 10% of those comprise half of the 10.8 to get those up to an adequate standard. So we're looking at those and prioritizing those. Also looking at reviewing and revising the mi military construction process to ensure the priorities are focused on war fighting readiness. We are looking at uh, Gen General Dahl and MCOM is working hard, I know AXIM is working hard to, to reinstitute the old CLS, now known as Installation Service Standard, to make sure that we identify and prioritize those programs and services that need to be funded in accordance with Army priorities and those pro Army priorities that directly impact war fighting readiness. And then lastly, when we look at all of this, we've got to make sure that we rebalance all of these programs, all the installation programs, in accordance with Army priorities and not individual wants and needs. Again, in accordance with Army priorities directly focused on war fighting readiness. We've been working uh, with Training and Doctrine Command, looking at a futures process because they have doctrine uh, for the Army and we must follow the same type of uh, process as we look at uh, installations of the future. As we look deeper into the future, just as the Army has those established processes for the future operating environment and weapons formations and training, we need a similar process for our installations. So IENE, AXIM, MCOM, uh, TRADOC, in Industry, Academia has all been partnering and will continue to partner uh, in future events. Uh, we're going to actually have an Installations of the Future Mad Scientist event uh, taking uh, the lead from TRADOC, things that they've been doing to help uh, modernize and get industry, academia, a local community input on uh, the best way to shape our installations of the future. With this established process, uh, we have a framework and we're going to look through three lenses that I want to share with you. We're looking at a new battlefield framework uh, that focused on multi-domain battle. Installations without question uh, are initial mover and, and, uh, initial mover and uh, maneuver and battle platforms and they're considered a part of the strategic support area as you saw in the video. I mean we are actually fighting battles from our installations today. It's not all being done in theater. And installations are without question a key component to war fighting readiness. Our threats are ever evolving as you saw. The operational threats, environmental threats, cyber, insider threats, et cetera, are things that we uh, must make sure that we stay on top of and address. And there is opportunity born of new technology. You know, something I saw yesterday in the, uh, the readiness a forum that was led by General Abrams. Uh, the, the, uh, the colonel from NTC made a very powerful statement that as we look at technology, we must not just look at future technology and ask people to develop things. We've got to look at the existing technology, the existing expertise that's out there, and capitalize on that. Uh, because our soldiers, uh, uh, our soldiers and families deserve nothing less. The process has five key characteristics. It's modeled, as I said, after just like TRADOC integrates capabilities into force design, we, we're, we're forming a, a similar design to determine what we want installations to do. And to start this process, we are working with the mad scientists and VIT that I talked about. We're going to evaluate internal and external scans that will help us identify and prioritize gaps for the Army. And we're going to use our newly created Installation Readiness Board of Directors to look at uh, those uh, important factors that I mentioned, those four things and the priorities for the Army. What is the Installation Readiness Board of Directors? Uh, those that were uh, f affiliated with the installation management community uh, 10, 10 plus years ago under uh, Secretary of the Army Guerin, 
We had the Installation Management Board of Directors that looked at all matters related to installations and uh, the MNRA, MWR issues under one body. Uh, that has been reestablished by the Secretary of the Army. It's going to be tri-chaired by the Vice Chief of Staff, the ASA for uh, MNRA, and also the ASA for IE and E. And it's going to have voting members to be the four stars uh, from the Army commands to look at the Army priorities. Again, what are the priorities? We all agree on them, and we, we provide resourcing in accordance with those Army priorities. Uh, it's got to be flexible uh, to consider stakeholder solar input and offer choices to those that work, train, and live on our Army installations, but then again in accordance with standards and Army priorities. It's got to be collaborative. I've mentioned academia. We'll be continuing to uh, work with, with academia for research, and we're going to benchmark with the private sector best practices, uh, particularly invo involving technological development. And we're going to make sure that we continue to look at and further refine and do additional public-public partnerships uh, to deliver our programs and services. It must be systematic, uh, iter iter iterative, with regularly occurring activities, with predictable outputs informed by research and analysis. And then last and most importantly there, all of this, it must be usable, it must be oriented towards measuring outcomes that influence future programming and allocation of resources. Without the resources, we can't be successful and deliver the programs and services that our service members and uh, families need. So uh, we remain committed to support and help provide the, the, the best readiness platforms for the Army and the best communities for our soldiers, families, and civilians. Creation of premier Army installations and communities begins with a solid process for looking into the future and bringing it into the present. Our priorities and funding must be tied to readiness, but we've got to identify that today. And don't forget, we've got to ask that question, what do we want our installations to do? And I, I, you know, thinking about this last night uh, when I was at Fort Bragg, and Fort Hood writing the strategic plans or something I thought of I just want to share with you. Uh, that from, from my view, you know, readiness is the foundation that makes our nation free. Our great soldiers, civilians, and family members are the blueprint to that foundation, and they are most deserving. Our future depends on them, and we must plan for the future today. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it over to my battle buddy, Lieutenant General uh, Gwen Bingham, and then uh, she'll make some comments, and we look forward to answering questions. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Randy. Good morning, everyone. Everybody feeling good? It's great to look out into the audience and see a lot of folks that uh, I've had the privilege to team and serve with. So as your Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management, I am definitely pleased to join ranks with Randy Robinson and the IE&E team, as well as our Assistant Sec Army for MNRA and FMNC, as we address policies, programmatics, and resourcing for the 156 installations that are around the world. And as Randy indicated, uh, we want to ensure that our Army installations are ready, not only today, but into the future to enable success while operating at home, abroad, and in the complexities of multi-domain battle, which you saw a little bit about General Perkins speaking to on the video. We know that our current operating environment is complex and will remain so, and so to that end, we must morph our thought processes a bit. Looking at the future, our Army installations must continually be uh, agile and they must adapt to the increasingly complex problem sets that we're faced with. And so looking at installations of the future, this is gonna be audience participations. We value your input, but here's three thoughts that readily come to mind when I think about future installations. First, I think three key attributes. Uh, one, installations of the future must be energy secure and resilient. And if you see the poster to my front, uh, you'll note that this is Energy uh, Security and Energy Action Month. So now's the time to be thinking about that. And I'll come back to that thought about energy security and resilience in just a moment. We want to leverage 
artificial intelligence, big data analytics, and the smart cities research that has already been begun over the past couple, three years in earnest to change the way that we deliver the services that are currently being provided today. And I'd ask each of you to think about that, and I'll come back and speak a little bit to it. And I believe, thirdly, we must continually leverage the partnerships. I've often said that there's nothing we do inside our gates without the full support and partnership of our many uh, partners and community leaders, industry, academia, outside our gates. So I will continually join Randy in advocating for partnerships to do our business. So number one, becoming energy security and resilient. I think there's a fantastic model that I, if you aren't already aware about, it sits at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. And at Schofield Barracks, the Army provided the land where the Hawaiian Electric Company is constructing a 50 megawatt tri-fuel power plant that they will own, operate, and maintain. And here's a little bit about that particular plant that's so unique. Uh, as a consideration for the lease, the Army gets first call on the electricity that's produced during sustained outages or security threats, ensuring that our national security and first response missions can be carried out even in, while the island uh, grid is compromised. And that has not been done anywhere in the world to date. As I mentioned before, it's a 50 megawatt firm power that is sufficient to meet the peak electricity requirements of, get this, Schofield Barracks, Wheeler Army Airfield, and Field Station Kenia. Never have we seen that, and that is currently in existence in Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. The plant is well above sea level, and it's above the tsunami zone, which is a good thing. So in the event of major uh, disruptions, the plant will also maintain the capability and the capacity to power up other Hawaiian electric generation. That's a great news story. I saw Christine Altendorf in the uh, audience somewhere. Christine, you know that well. Stand up so people have additional questions. They can talk to Christine about that and uh, Katie Dahl in MCOM. I think that type of cooperation and partnership uh, is such that we can enhance our military capabilities while at the same time maintaining a ready, resilient, and strong army in the face of complex and new threats. Number two I talked about, when we talk about leveraging artificial intelligence and the work that's being done in smart cities uh, technology, I think we can potentially change the way that we are providing services now. And some that immediately come to mind is how we do our access control at installations, deliver various services, or even shop. So imagine this, the wide use of autonomous vehicles for transportation throughout a post camp and station, unmanned vehicles. That technology exists today. Maybe there's a partnership as we look to installations of the future where we can expand upon that. Or in the case of our facilities, we can analyze real time data that tells us when building repairs are actually needed and then could cost that out for us. How cool would that be? No more ISR, Paul Brooks. <laughs> right now, many of you have phone apps on your phones right now. Phone apps to Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, uh, the coffee shop. My husband's favorite is uh, the donut shop. Uh, so you can order on your phone app, and then voila, you can pick that up for your breakfast or your lunch at your convenience. Amazon or similar on-demand services can deliver everything you and me, we wait for in line today. And so that's a capability I would think that we can exploit on our installations of the future. And right here in the DC area, who's heard of places like Peapod, Blue Apron, and several other companies that routinely deliver groceries to our busy families? Those are just a few snapshots in time of what we know that technology is existing today. But technology can be used to great advantages, but we all know that it also creates vulnerability. 
So as we evolve to what we call the Internet of Things, we want to ensure that we can continually defend against our critical infrastructure such that forms the backbone of Army readiness. So while that technology is still emerging and our strategic planning continues, we welcome the opportunity to partner with industry, academia, or other uh, local and federal entities and explore setting up perhaps a pilot installation of the future where we can work together for solutions to our many complex challenges. I'll tell you this though, without a doubt, there is something that will not change today and into the future. And it is the premier asset that we all know, it's our people. It's our soldiers, our civilians, and our family members that truly make this Army strong. Every single day, my battle buddy Randy and I have the privilege to serve, to team with all of the amazing folks who are doing a phenomenal job for this Army and their families. It's because of the people and their strong resolve to enable readiness at home and on the battlefield. It's through their steadfast tenacity, commitment, and that never quit spirit, that can-do spirit in our families, that our Army will continually remain the best Army in the whole of the world. Thank you all for coming to join us. We look forward to your questions. Uh, All right. Well, good morning. Jeff Proch from Johnson Controls. First of all, I'd like to thank Hi, Jeff. this team here for your accessibility, both here and downstairs in the installation community assembly area. It's just been great. Uh, my question is, in the past, we've been having some challenges with SRM funding. What are the prospects for FY 2018? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and great to see you again. So FY18, uh, right now that funding is looking uh, very good for our portfolio. In point of fact, if we get uh, what's uh, uh, on the hill to get, we could stand to, uh, to increase uh, just above a billion dollars. And so we have plans, if we get that, to put it to great use, not only for our infrastructure and our facilities, but for our soldier and family programs as well. Thank you for the question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Ellen Milheiser, Synopsis Newsletter. Um, there are moves in Congress to include, there are moves in Congress to increase the number of patients who come into Army medical facilities in order to increase the number of trauma patients. This would, of course, mean more people coming onto base. Have y'all taken that into account? Have y'all talked about that with Army Medical Command? Probably Have you talked about it with Congress? Probably uh, that's outside of our portfolio. I can take your question to our Surgeon General and perhaps DHA. So we'll make a note of that. Uh, they had a family forum just yesterday. So if you leave us your name and phone number, we'll connect you. Thank you for coming. Appreciate your question. Yes, sir. Hi, John Anderson, AT&T. Uh, Ma'am, you mentioned a little bit about uh, big data analytics and smart cities concepts. I know there's already some pilots out there for smart bases, um, how the internet things is working in interconnected devices. Is there uh, a plan for future expansion of those pilots, future expansion of those pilots, or even a long-range plan for full adoption throughout the Army? Yeah, that's a great question, one that Randy and I are really excited about. So we, we know that a lot of research, R&D, has gone into uh, big data, analytics, and smart cities. And so what we're looking to do as we talk about the Internet of Things, we are absolutely uh, very uh, hopeful for some type of a pilot uh, in the coming uh, months uh, that we might be able to join forces with industry and academia to explore the possibilities of a installation of the future pilot of some sort. So Thomas thank you. you. John Thompson, raise your hand. John Thompson is, is putting all this together. I mean, all of the events that I, I was mentioning uh, about the, uh, the, the smart city concept, mad scientists, et cetera, a whole list of events that we're going to be working. You might want to chat with him afterwards. He can give you some really good details. Thanks, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Next question, back in the back. Good morning. Thanks for your presentation. My question, I'm Lindy Walner from Stanley Consultants. My question is regarding your energy uh, initiatives and other kind of joint 
efforts. How is the Army leveraging your partnerships with the other services, the Air Force, the Marines, the Navy, on similar issues and best practices in these areas? Okay, if, if I, uh, I'll comment on that one. Uh, uh, years ago, the Army established the Office of Energy Initiatives to look at uh, large renewable energy projects, 10 megawatt or uh, 10 megawatt. 10, 10 megawatts or larger, uh, very successful uh, with that. You know, the Schofield project that was uh, mentioned, uh, another example of success would be the 65 megawatt joint solar and uh, wind project at Fort Hood, which is saving uh, $100 million over a 30-year period. Uh, many of those have been done by the Office of Energy Initiatives. Uh, the Air Force saw the benefit of that, and uh, they asked if they could partner with us. So the Air Force is actually co-located with us, and, and uh, so they don't have to start up with all of the expertise that we, uh, you know, spent several years developing. We're partnering on that, and we're also sharing that uh, knowledge with the Navy, and have offered them to join us as well. Thank you. Good question. Other. Okay. Okay, a quick question, and I just want your all's thoughts on this. I don't want to ask too much because you'll probably assign it to me. Um, but as we are moving to Army installations of the future and very focused on smart buildings, and we'll, I'll give Humphreys as an example, um, many, many, many new buildings and all very smart. So our workforce right now is not necessarily trained for the maintenance of smart buildings. And then we also have the, the cyber threats because when you have a smart building, everything is computerized and... and they can get into your systems in the easiest of ways, whether it be a HVAC system or, or you know, running a credit card on an MWR system. So, so what do you all see as what we need to do as managers of the installations and getting our works, workforce up to speed on really being able to handle this and then working with really um, the cyber folks on how we can become protected um, you know, with all of the smart buildings? Yeah, Christine, thanks for the question. I think that's certainly an area that we want to come together to partner. And, and what readily comes to mind is the Corps of Engineers as they build uh, many of our facilities and the, the, the HVAC systems and uh, facility control systems are becoming more and more complex. So you almost have to have some technical degree to be able to operate those. We've talked about that. And I think uh, probably establishing some sort of training program as we go along building the buildings so that we can really nurture and grow that workforce to where they have the uh, capability and skill sets to be able to diagnose facility uh, problems when they arise. But that's very definitely one that we know that uh, the skill sets are maturing and changing. So anybody who's interested in IT or uh, those kinds of skill sets that get after those uh, improved uh, technologies is certainly where we want to find those kinds of people. Here's one back here, Randy. Sir, Sir ma'am, uh, Jonathan Shaw, Office of the Chief of Chaplains. Thank you for your presentations. Um, as we work toward Army installations of the future and enabling warfighter readiness, I'd like to ask a question regarding the sense of community. Uh, what you see is key and essential for initiatives to build that sense of community that, it, that it is that deep empowerment for readiness. And the reason I raise it is because our society is in increasingly fragmented and individuated. So what do you see as key and essential moving forward to strengthen our sense of community on installations? Thank you. Um, I would tell you that 30 to 35 percent of our people live on the base, so you've got 60 to 65 percent live off the base. And so you're, you're going to have a sense of community for sure, I would think, on the base, uh, just because 35 percent of the folks live on the base. I think community uh, for many people is very important, but I also know that there are others who enjoy being off into the community. And so I think that 30 70 split or 65, 35 percent split. For those who want to be on the military base, that sense of community could be afforded them where there are housing uh, opportunities on the base and yet uh, be able to have the um, opportunity to live off post and take advantage of some of the community off the base. 
So I think it's uh, kind of a mixed bag, but you get to enjoy either or. To add to that, you know, you've got to find that balance. And I agree you've got to have, you know, the community, you have the camaraderie, you esprit de corps on the installation. But remember, we're trying to be a more resilient Army, and we're doing more partnerships. And we've got to continue doing more partnerships with the local communities as we move into the future. So that sense of community needs to expand beyond the, uh, the walls or the fences of the installation and include the entire community as we move into the future. And one great example is the great programs that you all uh, provide. Uh, you know, those things um, need to be provided and should be provided off the installation as well as on the installation to make sure the service members of their families have the uh, religious activities that they desire. Thank you. I think there's a partnership opportunity, to your point, Randy, both on and off the base, uh, Chaplain, but thank you for what you do for our families. We greatly appreciate you. Question here? Ma'am, sir, Colonel Joanna Reagan, I'm part of Army Public Health Center, and I'm also a team member of Healthy Army Communities. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about how do we enhance the marketing and messaging that goes along with Healthy Army Communities as we try to improve the food environment on our military installations, the physical activity, and the cultural environment on our demonstration installations and throughout our Army installations? That's a great question. And I'll tell you, actually, when I first got here, probably six, almost 16 months ago now, uh, the chief put that one in my rucksack and the G4's rucksack as we talk about dining facility, menu choices, to make sure that we bring in healthy products for our soldiers and our families to enjoy. So we have continued to work to that end to make sure that uh, we have a good range and a good mix of uh, available food items to offer our families on the installations. We think that's very viable or vitally important. Also, what ties to that is the whole sense of fitness. And I'm talking about physical fitness. So your body is what you put into it. And so we want to make sure we have choices, those healthy choices you talk about, that Surgeon General talks about the triad, and certainly uh, fitness and food is part of that along with sleep. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you okay. Uh, hi, Phil Sackowitz. Ooh, Phil Sackowitz. I'm going to stay with the chaplain's comment a little bit more about the community area, because some of it, it seems to me, is, I mean, you said Gwen, so 35% on, 65 off, but there's a lot of competition off that it seems to me are either dragging some people off, evolving, um, or just keeping them off if they're living out. For instance, all this grocery trend of buying at home so they're not coming to the commissary. So for the installation of the future, is that something we're just going to let, let that technology happen? Are we satisfied with the 35% that are on post? Or might there be more to go with the community and let the community do more and, and less than the 35 percent. I'm doing the 35 percent. Facilities with MilCon and you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the commissary. Let's look at uh, the commissary. Let's look at all the exchanges. Let's look at this, uh, the main exchanges, the small exchanges. Do they need to be inside the fence? There are some models. When I went to Norfolk, I mean, they had shopettes outside the fence. So when you reduce the amount of throughput and output to the installation, if you look at the, at the service level, you can, have, in many cases, reduce the number of security guards you have, so that's something we're looking at. Do we need all the people, the current numbers, to continue residing on post, whether it be single soldiers, whether it be family members? I'm not saying we're do, making any changes to that, but that's something that we're looking at. What is the right answer? We have a lot of privatized housing today. Does that all need to be located in the current footprint as we continue to build uh, new housing? That's something that we've got to look at. But we do need to rely on local communities more, you know, help become more resilient, but the Army is still going to make sure that we provide for the uh, programs and services for all of our service members and their families. The question is, how do we do it, and who are the providers? A great question. Thank you. And I think, Phil, that's why that we will continue to have that company to the customer. Thanks for the question. All right. Everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming out today. We are now out of time.
but our uh, senior leaders will be downstairs, as will our subject matter experts at the installation management community area, which is uh, booth 1725, essentially two stores, two stories below where we are. So again, thanks for your time, thanks for your interest, and General Bingham, Matt, Randy Robinson, thank you both.